June 6, 1944, 0300, three hours and 30 minutes until the landing at Omaha Beach. The Allied fleet has come to a stop. Soldiers stand aboard wet decks preparing to launch the largest amphibious invasion ever attempted. They look at the men standing next to them, knowing that before the day is over, many of their brothers will become bloody corpses lying on the sands of Omaha Beach. The ship rocks on choppy water. The wind is supposed to be calm. The water still. Instead, it feels like a storm is brewing. However, the storm will not be one of rain and lightning, but artillery shells, machine guns, and explosions. A colonel shouts orders across the deck. The soldiers begin loading onto their landing vessels. They cling to their weapons as if they were life preservers. Some pray to God, others think of their families back in the U.S. These American troops are responsible for taking Omaha Beach and securing it at all costs. It will act as an allied foothold in France, something that is needed if the Nazis are to be defeated. The men are secured in their vessels. They lower into the black waters of the English Channel. The sound of heavy breathing and retching from seasickness fill the Higgins boats. The landing craft circle around the fleet, waiting for every vessel to be ready before racing toward the shore in a unified force. Royal Air Force bombers soar overhead. They unleash their payloads on targets across the landing zones and coast of France in preparation for the invasion. The engines of the Higgins boats begin to ramp up. It's almost time for the invasion of Omaha Beach to begin. 0455 one hour and 35 minutes until the landing in Omaha Beach. Water sprays against the faces of the American soldiers crammed into the Higgins boats as they proceed toward their landing zones. The current is stronger than expected. The landing ships drift off course. Their helmsmen desperately try to stay on target but to no avail. If their routes aren't corrected, the troops will land at the wrong section of the beach and the Nazi defenses will decimate the invasion force. 0550, 40 minutes until the landing at Omaha Beach. The deafening sound of cannons cuts across the water. Allied warships unleash hell on the German defenses at Omaha Beach. Cloud cover and smoke make it difficult to see if their targets are being hit, but the ships continue to fire anyway. Shells blast holes in concrete structures and rockets explode, wiping out weapon caches. The landscape becomes pocked with craters as the bombardment from the water continues. German gun batteries fire back, but the fleet is still shrouded in darkness. All that can be seen from the shoreline are giant muzzle flashes. 64 DD amphibious tanks cruise through the water toward the shoreline. The troops aboard the Higgins boat smile at the tanks as they stream by. These vehicles will act as the main support force once the landing begins. However, the tanks struggle to move through the water. A few thousand yards from the shore, the DD tanks begin to sink. The infantry units aboard the landing crafts watch in horror as one vehicle after another disappears beneath the blackness of the English Channel. Even worse, their Higgins boats begin to fill with water. Soldiers take their helmets off and begin bailing water to keep their boat from sinking. The invasion hasn't even begun and Allied forces are already in trouble. This does not bode well for the rest of the operation. 0630. The landing at Omaha Beach begins. The Higgins boats come to a stop. There's too much debris, anti-landing obstacles, and metal barriers in the way. The soldiers have to get out a little further from shore than they'd planned. There are explosions all around the landing zones as the Nazi artillery and mortars shell the coast. One of the explosives hits a landing craft. It detonates, sending chunks of metal, wood, and human body parts flying into the air. The commanders of each company try to calm their men as the signal is given to lower the ramp. There's a groaning sound and then a click. The front end of the Higgins boats fall forward, exposing the American soldiers and revealing a wide open beach in front of them. The moment that the ramps are lowered, absolute carnage breaks out. Nazi gunners have been waiting for this very moment. Machine gun fire erupts from pillboxes stationed above the shoreline. Bullets rip through entire units before they can even step foot outside of their landing vessels. Entire companies lie dead on the floors of their crafts, while others bob lifelessly in the waters turned red by blood. But some make it to shore. They will fight, they will do their duty, and they will seize the day. March 1943, one year and three months until the landing at Omaha Beach. Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan of the British Army sits in his dimly lit office, scribbling battle plans on pieces of paper. His wastebasket is full of crumpled up ideas. Every Allied general knows that the only way to defeat the Nazis will be to re-establish a foothold in France. From there, the British and Americans can help the French resistance liberate their country and put pressure on Hitler's western flank as the Soviets push from the east. But reaching France from the British Isles is easier said than done. Morgan rubs his temples and takes a gulp of whiskey. He hasn't slept in days. The plan to reach France consumes him. He's just been given the title of Chief of Staff, Supreme Allied Commander. The honor weighs heavily on him as a Supreme Commander has yet to be appointed. He and other members of the Allied leadership have been brainstorming invasion plans for weeks and nothing seems to be a viable option. General Morgan places his head in his hands and rubs his eyes. He lets out a sigh and leans back in his chair. All is silent in the late hours of the evening. Although it isn't a good option, it might be the best the Allies have. 
He pulls an old draft of Invasion Scenario out of his desk drawer and looks it over once again. I hope I don't regret this, he thinks. August 1943, one year and two months until the landing at Omaha Beach. Allied leaders meet at the first Quebec conference codenamed Quadrant in Canada. So given all the options, this is the best one. A high-ranking general says, he's just presented the plan that Frederick Morgan and his team came up with to gain a foothold in France. Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and William Lloyd Mackenzie King, Prime Minister of Canada, nod their heads in approval. These leaders and their military advisors have heard several ideas, but it's the plan designed by Lt. Gen. Morgan that most in attendance agree will have the best chance of success. There is further discussion, but by the end of the conference, everyone agrees Morgan's plan is the best they'll get. November 21, 1943 seven months until the landing at Omaha Beach. A meeting of the German Armed Forces High Command is about to begin. From outside the window comes cheers and Sieg Heils from the gathered masses. Germany has conquered much of Europe, and nationalism for the country is strong and the populace. Many know of the darker side of the war and the genocide happening at concentration camps across the continent, but the Nazis have promised victory and glory, something many Germans want. The German people firmly believe that it is their destiny to conquer Europe and create an Aryan Empire. Field Marshal Rommel, Adolf Hitler says to the room full of Nazi military leaders. Your success in the initial invasion of France was very impressive. You've proven yourself to be a competent strategist. I'm putting you in charge of improving our defenses along the French coast. The man known as the Desert Fox bows his head in acceptance of his new task. I'll make sure the Allies never step foot on the shore of France, mein Führer. Rommel's grand plans to extend minefields, increase anti-landing craft obstacles, and construct more pillboxes along the coast of France. If the Allies try to land on any of its beaches, they will be slaughtered by Nazi defenses. The flames of war rage in Rommel's eyes as he envisions Germany decimating Allied forces and forcing a surrender. December 31, 1943, six months until the landing in Omaha Beach. Allied soldiers jump into the frigid waters of the English Channel. Their commanding officers shout orders at them. Keep going! The Nazis aren't going to care how cold the water is or how well you can swim. The soldiers are practicing their first series of amphibious exercises to prepare them for an assault on the French coastline. 16,000 troops plunge into the water while helmsmen practice maneuvering their crafts into position. American and British generals watch from the shore of Slapton Sands as their men practice for days to prepare for D-Day. They have too much gear, one of the commanders says. They're sinking to the bottom like rocks. There are a series of kinks that need to be worked out. This will not be a simple task. It will take months to prepare the troops for what will be one of the most important days of the war. The exercises are run and run again. Each time a new challenge arises, modifications are made, and the troops reset for another series of drills. If these exercises don't go well, the whole operation might need to be called off. January 1944 a midget submarine surfaces under cover of darkness just off the coast of Normandy, France. Their mission is crucial to the success of Operation Overlord. Two men look through binoculars at the sands of Omaha Beach. The lights of a Nazi patrol can be seen moving along a ridge a few thousand yards down the beach. If these men are caught, they will be tortured for information. They've been ordered to avoid capture at all costs. The Allies can't afford details about their invasion plan falling into Nazi hands. I'm going for it one of the men whispers. He dives into the water and begins swimming toward the shore. His crewmate keeps an eye on the coastline. The soldier reaches standing depth and wades through the water to the beach. He must proceed a few dozen feet up the shoreline to get a good sample. He crouches in the sand and scoops some into a jar. He peers around to make sure no one is hiding in the shadows. The clouds break and the moon casts a faint glow onto the beach. For a moment, the allied soldier is illuminated in the open. Time to go, he whispers to himself. He screws the lid back on the jar. Out of the corner of his eye, the soldier sees movement. He drops to his stomach and lies perfectly still. A couple of Nazi soldiers climb down from the rock wall near the base of the ridge and walk along the beach. There's a small flash of light as one of the German soldiers strikes a match and lights a cigarette. The men lean against the wall and talk. The conversation seems to last for hours, but in reality it's only a few minutes. The Allied soldier lies motionless in the sand the entire time. Eventually, the cigarette is finished and the butt flicked away. The Nazis climb back up the wall and into their labyrinth of defensive trenches. The Allied soldier lets out all the air in his lungs. Feels like he's been holding his breath the entire time. Staying low to the ground, he crawls back toward the water. When he gets to the gently lapping waves, he dives in and swims back to the midget sub. He's pulled aboard by his crewmate. That was close, he says. They climb back into the craft and seal the hatch. The soldier sits down, takes out a marker, and writes Omaha Beach on the jar. He places the sand-filled container next to several others with different names written on them. Utah, Gold, Juno, and Sword are among them. The sand will be taken back to Allied scientists and engineers to be analyzed. They need to make sure that the consistency of each beach is suitable for the deployment of tanks and other heavy vehicles for the invasion. March 1944 – Three months until the landing at Omaha Beach 
The roar of aircraft engines fills the skies over France. Target spotted, a pilot says over his headset. Begin bombing run. Air raid sirens wail across the French landscape. Nazi troops sprint toward anti-aircraft guns and unleash hell into the skies. Bright flashes illuminate the night as shells explode and tracer rounds rip through the air. Allied planes are hit by these countermeasures, sending them careening toward the ground below. We're over the drop zone, a commander screams. Release your payload! The bomb bay doors of the planes open. They drop hundreds of tons of explosives on the railways and train yards below. Their mission is to disrupt Nazi supply lines and prevent them from using the French rail network to deliver troops and supplies to the coast of France. It's clear to the Nazi leadership that the Allies have some sort of plan in the works, but they're still unsure of where they'll strike. Planes from the German Luftwaffe rise into the air. Dog fights break out over France. The Allies are outnumbered. The bombers turn back toward the English Channel. Their escorts bravely hold back the German fighters so the bombers can escape. Planes on both sides are shot down. Many of the pilots die in fiery explosions. Others gently glide to the ground if they're lucky enough to escape their craft and deploy their parachutes. However, Allied pilots who do survive ejecting from their planes face a new series of obstacles. The Nazis must not capture them. They hide in the forests of France or link up with the French resistance. All they can do is wait and pray that the invasion force succeeds in their mission. April 7, 1944, two months until the landing at Omaha Beach. General Bernard Montgomery presents a final set of plans for Operation Overlord to Winston Churchill and other Allied commanders. I've made a slight modification to the original plan, Montgomery explains. There are unique challenges for each landing site, but Omaha is going to be particularly difficult. The Allied leaders look at each other. It's clear more work needs to be done if their forces are going to be successful in gaining control of the French coast. The Royal Navy deploys ships to different strategic locations along the English Channel. They drop mines around the waters of German bases to prevent deadly Nazi torpedo boats from attacking the invasion fleet as it crosses toward France. Allied command is worried that even if the troops make it to shore, it will still be hours before much of the equipment can be ferried to the beaches. This provides ample time for the German e-boats to attack and destroy Allied vessels and the equipment they carry. May 2, 1944, one month and four days until the landing at Omaha Beach. Fabius, the largest series of training exercises in preparation for Operation Overlord are carried out along the coast of southern England. This will be the final training run before the invasion itself. 25,000 troops are crammed aboard landing vessels and refine their deployment maneuvers. Unfortunately, no amount of practice will be able to prepare them for the bloodbath they'll face during the real thing. The D-date was set for May 1st, but the delivery of equipment and securing of more landing craft has been slow. Allied command looks at tide charts in the lunar calendar. They need a night with low tides and a mostly full moon to operate effectively in the darkness. Two different time periods are identified as meeting all criteria. They're between June 5th and June 7th, and June 18th and June 20th. It's not clear yet which will be the best date. Hopefully, all vessels will be ready by early June and the weather will be favorable, as the sooner Operation Overlord is launched, the better. Late May 1944. Allied troops are in camps along the southern coast of England. They're not prisoners, but it's what it feels like. They're not allowed to leave their base and can have no communication with the outside world. Allied command is concerned that if any messages are intercepted by Berlin or a Nazi spy stumbles upon their plans, the invasion and war as a whole could be lost. It's now clear the invasion of France is imminent. The soldiers have mixed feelings of excitement and dread. They want to reclaim Europe from the Nazi bastards, but know that their mission is dangerous and there will be many casualties. They play card games and smoke cigarettes while talking about the loved ones they have waiting for them back home. At naval yards, vehicles and equipment are waterproofed to ensure they are still operational when they reach the shores of France. It isn't until the very last days of May that the troops are given their final orders for D-Day. Most soldiers still don't know what the exact plan for D-Day is because this information is on a need-to-know basis. May 31, 1944, six days until the landing at Omaha Beach. Grab your gear, prepare to load up, a commander shouts. Allied troops make their way to the ships waiting at the docks across the English coast. The size of the invasion force is so large that the embarkation process needs to be spread out over the course of five days. The soldiers who are loaded onto ships during the first day will have to wait in cramped quarters until the process is complete. This is uncomfortable but a necessity if the fleet is going to be ready to move on time. June 1, 1944, five days until the landing at Omaha Beach. Le Sangloulon, De Viron, De Luton, Blesse Moutquia, D'une Longueur, Monoton. The first lines of a Paul Verlaine poem are broadcast over the airwaves by the BBC. An operator in the French resistance rips off his headset and darts through the hallways of a rundown building. He bursts through the door of a secluded room. Leaders of the French resistance sit around the table planning their next series of operations. Sir, Chanson de Ton is playing on the radio. The Brits and Americans are preparing to launch their invasion. 
The French commanders jump up from their seats and rush out of the room. They turn on the radio and listen to the poem being broadcast. Get me the other generals, one of the men shouts. We need to make sure everyone knows the Allies are coming. In Berlin, a Nazi intelligence officer stands at attention. I believe the poem is a message to the French resistance, mein Führer, he says to Hitler. The fascist dictator reads over the words of the French poem. What does it mean? He asks. The intelligence officer pauses for a moment, slightly afraid that he doesn't have a good answer. We're unsure. It could be instructions for an attack on our forces. The officer pauses again. Some have suggested it might be a signal that the British and Americans are about to launch an invasion, but we can't be sure. Hitler clutches the message tightly, crumpling the paper in a fit of rage. Tell your team to figure it out, and don't leave this building until you do, Hitler shrieks. If the Allies are about to attack, I need to know. The intelligence officer salutes and runs out of Hitler's office. Across France, encoded messages are received by resistance fighters. They come out of hiding and carry out a series of sabotage missions to cripple the Nazis' ability to move men and supplies through the region. Railroads are blown up, weapon caches are destroyed. The French resistance does as much as they can to disrupt the Nazi military and draw attention away from the invasion force that will be making its way across the English Channel. They don't know the exact day of the attack, but the Chanson de Ton poem was the signal that the invasion would begin within a month. June 3, 1944, three days until the landing at Omaha Beach. Group Captain James Stagg looks at the data coming in from weather stations throughout the region. The invasion has been set for June 5th, but all the information he's received makes him conclude it would be a mistake to try and attack the coast of France then. He informs Allied command that D-Day should be postponed. The majority of the men and equipment have already been loaded onto ships and are ready to be deployed. What do you mean we can't launch on June 5th? A British general yells. Sir, it'd be too dangerous for our forces. The landing vessels could tip over or run into one another. It would be a disaster, Stagg responds. There is a disgruntled discussion in the room. Winston Churchill puffs smoke from his cigar. Let's give it another day and see if the weather clears up, the Prime Minister says. There's agreement. Captain Stagg continues to monitor weather patterns. June 4, 1944, two days until the landing at Omaha Beach. The weather hasn't gotten any better, sir. We need to postpone the invasion. There's cursing from Allied generals who are in the meeting. Call back the ships. Allied Expeditionary Forces Supreme Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower says, The vessels that have already been deployed in preparation for the invasion are recalled. The fleet waits in the harbors across southern England until they receive their next set of orders. Later that day, an Allied officer bursts into the war room with a shocked look on his face. Generals, you need to hear this, he stammers. He turns on the radio. The Associated Press is reporting that the invasion of France has already begun. What the hell is this? Churchill roars. Get me whoever's in charge of that station now. Five minutes later, Churchill slams the phone into its receiver. There, that's dealt with, he says just before sticking the stub of his cigar back in his mouth. The Associated Press immediately issues a retraction of their statements. Allied Command finds out that a teletype operator was practicing for the actual event and didn't realize the machine was connected. The message went out to listeners around the globe, including in Germany. The Allies are now very concerned that Hitler will strengthen his position on the French coast if given enough time. The invasion needs to be launched immediately. June 5, 1944, 0415, one day until the landing at Omaha Beach. It's decided then, Supreme Commander Eisenhower says. The weather for tomorrow looks good. We launch Operation Overlord on June 6, alert the junior officers to open their sealed orders for their landing locations. There's no going back now. The members of Allied Command jump into action. Across the invasion force, envelopes are torn open, and company leaders read their orders to their troops. June 5, 0600 hours. The first group of Allied ships leaves port. They proceed to the English Channel and toward Normandy, France. It's the slowest ships that depart first to give them enough time to get into position. June 5, 2300 hours. Plane engines roar to life. Aircraft begin to take off from airfields across England. They carry British and American airborne troops that will deploy behind enemy lines using parachutes and gliders. These men will engage in fierce battles as they try to connect with the main invasion force at key points further inland. The Allied invasion fleet cuts through the waters of the English Channel. Both the ships and aircraft that have just departed hope they can reach their destinations before being detected by the Nazis. If they gain wind of the invasion fleet before they're in position, it could be disastrous. It's a tense few hours before Allied forces are finally in position, but thankfully they reach their objectives without being discovered. June 6, 1944, 0-hundred, six hours and 30 minutes before landing at Omaha Beach. Minesweepers cruise in front of the main fleet to make sure the route is clear. It's slightly cloudy, but the moon shines through a haze as the Allied fleet makes its way across the English Channel. Within a few hours, they are in position. 0300, three hours and 30 minutes until the landing at Omaha Beach. The landing craft drop into the water and begin making their way toward their targets. American soldiers heading to Omaha Beach receive inspiring words from their commanders as they prepare for the bloody battle to come. 0630, the landing at Omaha Beach begins. 
Every single company in the 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions has been forced off course to the east. The planned landing zones mean nothing anymore. Every soldier needs to make quick decisions and work with what they're given as machine gun fire, mortar explosions, and artillery shells bombard Omaha Beach. Nazi defenses decimate Allied forces. From a key vantage point at Pointe de Duc, Nazi soldiers have a clear view of the entirety of Omaha Beach and all the locations of Allied forces. Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder commands the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions. They're tasked with taking out this key vantage point to allow Allied landing craft to unload safely. The company is taking heavy fire, but they are quickly approaching the shoreline. Once there, Rudder and his troops will need to traverse minefields and deadly enemy defenses, but if they do not succeed, Omaha Beach could be lost. The bulk of the first wave of Allied troops reached their disembarkation points. They wade through the water to try to reach the sands of Omaha. There's no cover anywhere, and many are mowed down by Nazi fire. Slowly and with massive casualties, the American forces begin moving across the beach toward the stone wall, 300 yards beyond the landing zone. These rocks provide some cover, but are by no means a safe place to regroup. It seems as if the Nazis have an endless supply of ammunition as the firing never ceases. More and more landing craft make it to shore, but every time a ramp drops, American soldiers are slaughtered by bullets, ripped apart by explosions, or drowned in the water as they try to reach the beach. The brave men who make it to the rock wall are now in position to try to disrupt the Nazi defenses so that vehicles and more troops can safely make it ashore. 0700, 30 minutes after the landing at Omaha Beach. The troops who made it to the rock wall try and push to the ridge running up to the Germans' main position. Crafts that were delayed or blown off course finally reach the shores of Omaha Beach. Their ramps are lowered and more soldiers jump into the water. Many need to use their knives to cut off gear that's weighing them down. Those that don't react quickly enough are dragged underwater and drown. Three battalions of the German veteran 352nd Infantry Division continually fire at the American troops in the killing zone of Omaha Beach. Lieutenant Colonel Rudder and his men finally make it to shore and proceed to climb the cliffs that rise up to Pointe de Duc. They crawl under barbed wire and proceed carefully through minefields. They encounter resistance, but most of the Nazis' attention is focused on Omaha Beach. Rudder and the 2nd U.S. Rangers continue up the cliff. The 5th Battalion is waiting for an all-clear signal before they follow. If the men of the 2nd are killed before taking out the German position, all hope could be lost. The 5th will join the main attack along Omaha Beach if the signal never comes. The 2nd U.S. Rangers make it to the top of the cliff. They're greeted by heavy enemy fire. The men dive for cover and return fire. They'd hoped there would be minimal resistance, but they have no such luck. Rudder orders his men forward. He leads the charge. The Rangers take out Nazi soldiers as they move closer to the casements that house enemy cannons and machine guns. The American soldiers use rocks, holes, and Nazi trenches for cover. Many are wounded but continue fighting. Eventually, they reach their target. Rudder and his men race through the opening of the bunker and take down the Nazis inside. To their horror, the main guns have been moved. The bombardment of Omaha Beach has been coming from further inland. Damn it, Rudder shouts. We need to find those guns. The men spread out, searching for the Nazi firing position. They're in small groups to cover more ground. Time is of the essence. A two-man team proceeds down a dirt road behind Pointe de Duc. They hear yelling in German and the firing of an artillery cannon. The two men look over at each other. There's no time to report back to the commander. The soldiers crouch down and move closer to the Nazi firing position. When they come to a small clearing, they see Nazi artillery pointed toward Utah Beach. It's unlikely anyone from that force will be able to make it up this far to secure the position. The two soldiers look at one another. One of them reaches into his satchel and pulls out a thermite grenade. The other man nods. On the count of three, one soldier whispers. One, two, three. The soldiers throw their grenades and wait for detonation. They explode next to the Nazi guns, causing them to melt. The cannons are rendered inoperable. The two soldiers fire upon the group of Nazi soldiers that remain. There were at least 100 before the grenades were thrown. Now only a few remain. The American soldiers fall back and rejoin their unit. Since it took too long for Rudder and his men to locate and destroy the guns, the 5th Ranger Division moves toward Omaha Beach. They engage in combat along the rock wall and enter the trenches running along the cliffs, using pistols, knives, and the butts of their guns to fight in close quarters. The American troops secure the lower part of the ridge. 0800, 90 minutes after the landing at Omaha Beach. American troops are still struggling to maintain their position on the main beach. The 2nd Rangers Division had secured the western flank, but if the other companies can't make forward progress soon, the battle may be lost. Eleven destroyers make their way closer to shore and offer fire support. Shells strike several of the major Nazi defensive positions and cause significant damage. With this distraction, small groups of soldiers begin to move forward. It's vital that American forces reach the top of the ridge and push the Nazis out of their pillboxes and bunkers. The destroyers go all in and charge closer to shore. Their hulls scrape against the bottom of the seafloor. This is inconsequential, as all that matters is supporting the troops on the beach. 
The destroyers continue to unleash a barrage of shells into the German defenses. We have to move now, while the destroyers are providing supporting fire. Follow me! One of the company leaders yells. He'd been only a private minutes before, but when the ramps fell and the Germans opened fire, the commanders and sergeants were the first to be hit. The soldier takes a group of men over the rock wall into the base of one of the ridges. Nazi bullets shatter stones all around them as the American troops cross an unshielded section of land. They make it to the bottom of the cliff. The platoon leader peers around the corner of a rock outcrop. On the other side is a Nazi defensive position. A machine gun nest lies only a few dozen feet away. The company leader signals his men to provide covering fire. On his signal, the soldiers begin unloading into the Nazi position. The company leader dashes out from cover and lodges a grenade into the nest. A moment later, the machine gun begins to fire. The American soldiers duck back behind cover. Their commander dives behind a rock and covers his head. The grenade detonates. Nazi soldiers fly into the air. Move forward, the company leader yells. The soldiers proceed up the ridge. Directly above them are multiple German defensive positions firing down on the American troops trying to cross Omaha Beach. Let's go, sir, the soldier says and begins up the bluff. Freeze, the company leader yells. The ridge is covered in mines. I'll go first. Follow me and mark my path. The men proceed slowly and carefully up the bluff. They are out of the direct line of fire, but the Nazi soldiers are stationed at different points along the cliff face, and firefights break out as the soldiers carefully make their way through the minefield. As they proceed, they drop a line of tape behind them to signify where the safe path up the ridge is. 1100, four hours and 30 minutes after the landing at Omaha Beach. The company reaches the top of the ridge and engages the enemy. They are protecting gun positions that are still firing down at the beach. The American troops fight their way from the eastern flank into the middle of the ridgeline, taking pillboxes, bunkers, and casemates all along the way. As they make their way through the enemy defenses, more and more troops make it up the ridge, following the tape that the first squad left behind. Nazi soldiers begin to surrender as they realize the American forces have gotten past their main line of defense. Other squads hold their position until the Allied troops manage to kill or wound them all. Even though the Americans are now winning, they've lost a lot more men than the Nazis. 1200, five hours and 30 minutes after the landing at Omaha Beach. German artillery is still firing, but the barrage of shells is considerably weaker. Between the 2nd Ranger Division on the western flank and the brave men from the 1st and 29th who made it across the blood-soaked sands of Omaha Beach, the Allied forces are moving closer and closer toward their main objectives. Transport craft carrying tanks, armored vehicles, and trucks begin to approach the shores. Engineering Corps are still working hard to clear obstacles, even as Nazi holdouts continue to fire at them. The main job of these engineers since the beginning of the onslaught was to dismantle Nazi anti-landing defenses, even though that meant they were stuck in the kill zone without any cover. Without these brave men, vital equipment would not have been able to make it to shore. The task has taken hours. Engineers have been slaughtered just like the infantrymen who raced across the sands of Omaha Beach. No one is safe from the wrath of the Nazis. 20 hundred. 13 hours and 30 minutes after the landing at Omaha Beach. For the last several hours, the road to St. Lawrence has been cleared. Infantry units have made progress and now have control of almost the entire ridgeline overlooking Omaha Beach. From this position, they can see hundreds of crafts approaching the now cleared landing zone on the sandy shores below. It's a beautiful sight after the death and destruction that unfolded over the course of the day. The soldiers that are now past the beach are clearing nearby small towns of any Nazi resistance. There's still a lot of fighting ahead for the survivors of the Omaha Beach invasion, as they have not secured many of the main objectives identified during the conception of the invasion plan. No one could have predicted how many things would go wrong for the Allied forces. Operation Overlord was going to cost the lives of many soldiers, but the casualty count on Omaha Beach is higher than any other location during the invasion. 2400 hours. D-Day ends. The Allies now have a foothold in France. Allied forces have only managed to advance about one mile inland. Out of all the goals of the Omaha Beach landing, only the easternmost objectives have been secured. Allied vehicles and troops are now flooding onto the mainland as more and more ships unload their cargo. The brave soldiers of the 2nd U.S. Rangers have managed to destroy or capture all of the long-range coastal guns and held back counterattacks all day at Pointe du Hoc. Out of the 225 soldiers who originally landed at the bottom of the cliff, only 90 survived. They're still the only Allied soldiers in this part of France, as the main force has not yet been able to break through the German defenses between the eastern side of the beach and Pointe du Duc. The exact number of lives lost during the invasions of Omaha Beach will never be known. The bodies of soldiers that were dragged out to sea or completely obliterated by Nazi shelling can never be recovered. 34,000 Allied troops engaged in the battle at Omaha Beach. Estimates put the number of American casualties at around 2,400 men in a matter of hours. The Nazis suffered around 1,200 casualties. So although the Allies have managed to secure Omaha Beach, it came at a great cost. As the sun rises the following morning, one thing is clear. Operation Overlord and the securing of Omaha Beach was a success, but the war is very far from being over. 
Now watch why World War II was so much deadlier than World War I, or check out 50 Insane World War II Facts That Will Shock You.